Good evening, everybody, and welcome to The Strand. My name is Robin, and I help direct the events here at Strand. For a little bit of history, The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 93 years, The Strand is the sole survivor, now run by third-generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. Under Nancy, the Strand is not only surviving in an increasingly competitive and unsure environment, but it is thriving. The Strand continues to famously hold over 18 miles of used, new, and rare books and now hosts nearly 400 events a year. In large part, this is thanks to all of you. Without our loyal community of book lovers, we would not be here today. Tonight, I'm so excited to be celebrating the 40th anniversary edition of Zagat's long celebrated guide to dining, arriving alongside the infatuations digital overhaul of the Z Zagat name, bridging the gap and inaugurating the next generation in a long tradition of restaurant discovery. Here to discuss the history and future of Zagat are Chris Stang and Eric Repair. Chris has been, since 2009, the architect of the infatuations editorial voice, creative vision, and marketing strategy. Today, he's the CEO of both Zagat and The Infatuation. He's helped create and launch Eats Gone, The Infatuation's food festival, architected the acquisition of Zagat, and the creation of the 40th anniversary edition of its New York Guide. In 2015, he was nominated for a James Beard Award for Underfinger, a review of a restaurant that does not exist. <laughs> Eric is universally renowned as one of the top chefs in the world from his four-star rating from the New York Times at 29 to his entire career at Le Bernardin, the only restaurant to maintain this superior status for 20 years without ever dropping a star. In 1998, the James Beard Foundation named Repair Top Chef in New York City and in 2003, Outstanding Chef in the United States. He's hosted PBS's Avec Eric, which earned two Daytime Emmy Awards and authored the book of the same title, in addition to several other cookbooks and the best-selling memoir, 32 Yokes. Please join me in welcoming Chris, Eric, The Infatuation, and Zagat to The Strand. Thank you so much. Can you guys hear okay? This is cool. Great. Um, wow, this is amazing. So before we get started, I just wanted to say, uh, obviously, thank you to Chef Repair and thank you to The Strand for having us. This is really, really cool. And I think, you know, especially for us, um, having, you know, acquired the Zagat brand, um, something that's so iconic and so legendary, it's, it's just really amazing to be able to do things like this with, uh, you know, again, an iconic brand and an iconic person uh, and to to sort of be able to shepherd Zagat into the future. And so when we talked about, you know, putting out the book and um, how we wanted to celebrate the, the brand's 40th anniversary and also just kind of what, you know, we wanted to do um, now that we were the new owners of Zagat, um, things like this were on the list, right? So we started talking about how do we make sure that we, um, you know, put the book in people's hands that, that want it. You know, again, this is the first time that the book has been out since, the, um, since 2016. Um, and, uh, and we wanted to just make sure that we were connecting and reconnecting with, um, the restaurant community, um, that obviously, you know, the gap doesn't exist without the restaurant community. So this event is to me like the culmination of all of that. And, and we're really happy to be here, um, uh, with chef repair. So just to start, I mean, you know, um, you heard it in the introduction that Laverna Denon is obviously, uh, in a class of its, of its own when it comes to the way that it's been received critically for a very long time. Um, it has had 29s across the board in the Zagat guide, I think, since 2010. God, God bless the guide. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, I think turn the mic on just oh in yes. case. Um, yeah, we will take credit for all of that, even though we we just did our the book the first time ourselves. But um, I think just one thing that that I'm curious about and that um, try just flipping the switch up right here. I think. Oh, yes. there you go. Yeah. Um, I think just you know one thing that certainly has, is true just from the data, but I think that, that all of us are interested in is um, the consistency and, and your ability to do so well year over year over year, even though so much in the restaurant world and, and dining and even just the world at large changes. So what to what do you attribute that consistency and success? Uh, th thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about that today. Uh, and thank you for having me in Zagat, especially in such a Beautiful position, number one. <laughs> um, <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Anytime. 
Uh, I think what what is important if you want to to have a restaurant that evolves and stay relevant and and please people and um, you need to you need to have two things. You need to have a team that is basically able to understand your vision and and support the vision and will create consistency as well and that's a big investment in terms of number of people working in the team but also in training in making sure that uh, that team is very loyal Co new york is very competitive it's a lot of possibilities for for um, our team to go work somewhere else and and the idea is to keep them with us as long as we can so that's one thing and then what you need to have also which is very important is to have the right investment in in the infrastructure um, of the restaurant you need to have you need to have a kitchen that will allow you to be consistent with the right equipment you cannot be cheap and say oh we're going to buy cheap pots and pans you have you have to invest a, a lot of money in the in the equipment um, you have to uh, invest a lot in in reinventing your dining room and and um, giving a fresh look and so on although all the, so team and and investment in the facility and how much do you guys i mean clearly there's a Laberna's on mission statement on, on some level i'm sure or at least you know exactly what you want to do when it comes to how you want to communicate with food but do you guys pay a lot of attention to tastes and trends that change uh, out there in the world and try to adapt or do you just stay focused on what you want to do and let it be what it is so we are we are um, always curious and we look at the trends but we don't necessarily evolve at the same pace as the trends because sometimes trends are like i mean it's uh, obvious trends and and they don't they don't last uh it's more like like an instinctive reaction toward w what's happening on in outside world and um what we have at le bernardin that guide our creativity for the food at least it's a mantra that says the fish is the star of the plate and therefore whatever goes into that plate is going to elevate the qualities of the fish um, that it's a great guide for us and then we evolve with uh, techniques uh, we so in the 2000s for instance when Ferran Adria in Spain was uh, playing with molecular cuisine we were observing what he was doing we were we never embraced molecular cuisine but later on we realized that some of these techniques were interesting and and they were allowing us to bring power powerful um, combinations of flavors and lightness at the same time so we integrated that into into our style but um, we we have evolved over the years le bernardin opened in 1986 and French restaurants in 1986 were pretty formal. The waiters didn't really um, interact with the clientele. It was a very different uh, ambience in, in those restaurants. Our um, service evolved over the years. Our food evolved over the years as well with, like I mentioned before, techniques and inspiration with new ingredients and, and being open to the world. and every 10 or 15 years you realize that the service and the food is ahead of the what's happening as as the decor so we do renovations we keep the style and the soul of le bernardin but we reinvent ourselves um, to basically be timeless but when you look at le bernardin in 1986 with those very heavy curtains very paris bourgeois style and you look at le bernardin today it's a tremendous difference but at the same time it's almost like seamless sure. so evolution has obviously been a, a key to success for you there's obviously been a lot of evolution in the world of restaurant criticism and you know zagat thankfully has been around for a very long time and there's obviously been a few others michelin and you know the new york times and we all know you know the big players that have been around a while um, and you guys have obviously done very well with all of the above what about the newer forms of criticism that um, have evolved, whether it's you know the rise of Instagram or the other user-generated things like TripAdvisor and Yelp? How do you guys think about that? How much do you pay attention to it? And how do you sort of, um, yeah, like just how do you choose what to, 
what to pay what to pay attention to well we pay attention to everybody uh, that for sure now we uh, we understand that Zagat and Michelin and New York Times um, have a certain reputation are legitimate and then we understand that sometimes on TripAdvisor when you read the review I mean you want to laugh <laughs> <laughs> right I mean like uh, there's some comedy in there <laughs> sure sometimes you want to cry too <laughs> but we pay attention to everybody it doesn't mean that it changed who we are we are not um, changing every five minutes because we get criticism on, on one aspect of the restaurant and then the day after we change again because we have another criticism or so positive or negative actually we just follow our instinct we just evolve um, organically and we are very lucky that uh, the big players are supporting us and and also a lot of people on on TripAdvisor and Yelp have, have great reviews and it's it's a great feeling of course do you think that younger people on your staff might be more affected by things they would read? I think certainly, I, you know, there are probably generational things that allow people to sort of tune out maybe the noise they see. Um, do you think the younger people feel more exposed to little comments here and there about things? I'm not sure because we never discussed that at the restaurant. We, we are busy basically creating an experience for, for the clients and we have a lot of interaction but we never talk about what's happening uh, on social media or, or something like that it's it's not a topic that com comes up in into the conversation um, and, and about instagram it has changed of course um, the life of the restaurants because you bring the food to the table and and suddenly iphones or, or <laughs> cell phones are taking pictures uh, all over and and different angles and wait don't pour the sauce wait all, all. Um, <laughs> and, but we um <laughs> we are very uh open-minded about yeah, open-minded that's <laughs> but yeah, i think it, that's interesting though right because that did happen over a pretty short span of time in the grand scheme of things right if within a yeah. few years it went from not existing to being something that suddenly you're you know, your sh your sommeliers and your servers are having to pause while there, you know, there's three different flashes at the same time. And yeah, yeah. We d the only thing we don't allow is the flash. <laughs> so you will stop someone and say, like, please. We we will say for the next course, please, no flash. Interesting. But th thank God, with technology, you don't need a flash any longer. Yeah. Your cell phone can take a good picture in the dark. <laughs> is is what you were just saying in terms of the way that you guys internally think about, you know tuning that stuff out or just not worrying about certain things. Is that the same advice that you would give a young new restaurateur that that's opening up and obviously trying to figure out how to navigate all that? Well, I think you have to have something that is very personal, um, something that you really care and are passionate a about. Because if you open a restaurant and you don't really have an opinion, then suddenly it's no soul. And uh, if it's no soul, it, it, people will not like that experience. Um, I, it's very important to be yourself. This this is my mantra for myself: be yourself. Good mantra. I uh, I wonder also though. Actually, was you know that mantra comes from a nightclub that was in downtown long time ago, that many of you probably don't know. But um <laughs> which one? <laughs> which one? I don't remember the name yeah. of it. It wasn't. <laughs> it's not important. It was in Tribeca and. Uh, I probably don't remember the name. I have d the good reason not to remember, <laughs> but um, <laughs> they were selling T-shirts. Be yourself. <laughs> um, so one thing that, that we've learned certainly since the Zagat guy came out is that um, you, you have a certain point of view on celebrating these accolades and how you approach it um, and what it means to, to you and, and I think more importantly to the team. Will you talk a little bit about, about that? Yes. We are not obsessed on on a daily basis with the accolades that we receive and i encourage the team not to think about the accolades and and really focus on on our daily duties which is for the cooks to cook and for the waiters to create an experience and for everybody in the restaurant to to support uh, our vision and we work hard at that but then when the guides come out or, or when a review comes out if it's positive we celebrate because 
it's very important. It's a, it's a great um, reward for the team. Uh, they're very sensitive to that. And we like to celebrate in style. So magnums of champagne, because we are French, we go to champagne Naturally. right away. Um, <laughs> magnums of champagne uh, pop. And uh, very often we have uh, late nights or after parties. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it depends on the season, but it's always very interesting um, how it ends up. <laughs> It, it seems like, as you talk about it, though, that the culture inside of your, your restaurant, but also your kitchen specifically, is, is important to you, um, wh whether it you know relates to how you celebrate or even just relates to the way that you approach hiring, training, and you know working day to day. Um, we were fortunate enough to have Eric uh, do a video with us for a new project we have coming called Zagat Stories, which is uh, an opportunity for us to do some storytelling around people like uh, Chef Repair and, and others uh, in his world. But um, you, we, we did get a chance to, to talk to you a little bit about the culture that you want to put forth in, in the restaurant and, and with the people that work for and with you. Do you want to talk a little bit about your point of view? Yes, well, the idea is to have young people coming to Le Bernardin with a passion and wanted to learn uh, our style, our techniques, uh, the, way, the way we approach uh, hospitality. And then we have the responsibility. They work hard. Everybody at Le Bernardin works really, really hard. So therefore, our responsibility is to make sure that they l everybody learns something. And of course, learning is endless. However, we have a system in place. For instance, in a kitchen, you start uh, in, in one part of the kitchen, which is the easy part, and you start to observe and, and you start to understand the dynamic and you start to be involved with the kitchen and more and more. And then we move you to different stations. And usually, two or three years later, you end up in a sauce station, which is the most mystical station in a restaurant, the most um, incredible station because um, it's when really cooking becomes an art because flavors are not tangible, exactly like notes of music are, uh, or colors. Well, colors are tangible, but notes of music are not tangible. And you cannot say to someone, create a dish with one ounce of rosemary flavor and two ounces of paprika flavor. It doesn't exist. It's all in the mind. So to reach that uh, understanding and to be able to master um, that uh, that basically uh, a vision that, that helps you to create a sauce, for instance, um, it takes time. So it's already three years. And then when you have mastered the sauce, which you'd really never master in life, you, it's it's ongoing forever, but when you start to be good at it, we, we have a program where you can become a sous chef, and, and sous chef is basically becoming a manager of the kitchen. And uh, that takes a long time also to, to be um, able to um, have a team following your orders, respecting you, um, and, and for you to drive th that team to success e every night. So that's takes a long time. And then in the dining room is the same. We have a process. You don't start as a captain right away. You start with a different job and then you evolve and potentially you become a captain and, and, and so on. And I think what was interesting as we were talking about this um, when, we, when we shot the video with you is you were also talking a little bit about as you think about obviously the process of getting your staff to where they need to be as professionals. You know, you also operate a bit of a, in a different way than maybe other kitchens operate from the way that um, you know you approach you know, management. And um, I'm curious just to, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about, you know, certainly, you know, we were talking before we came out here about uh, Eric's time at a legendary restaurant uh, called La Tour d'Argent in Paris. And I'd imagine that the kitchen culture at a place like that is very different than, at least from what I understand you to be trying to create in your environment. And so, I'd, you know, I'd love to just hear a little bit about your point of view on like how to, you know, fix problems when they come up and encourage, you know, positive behaviors and the rest. Sure. Uh, in the 1980s, when I was basically a teenager and, and started in La, in La Tour d'Argent, the, the philosophy uh, to train chefs or, or to train anyone in the restaurant or industry was interesting because the idea was to break the psychologically the individual 
and rebuild him and potentially make him a champion, make her a champion. Um, so basically, you will go as a young kid in the kitchen, for, uh, for me, um, and then you will be abused by your chefs and sous chefs and by the older cooks. Uh, they will insult you all day long. They will kick you in the butt. They will punch you in the shoulders. Um, they will throw things at you, uh, and so on. And and that was common practice in the kitchens in France at that time. I don't know today how it is, but. Um, Chefs were mini dictators, and it was accepted. And actually, chefs were having a good time being dictators. <laughs> and um, uh, I grew up like that. Then, when I came to the U.S. Uh, and when I had my first chef position, I I was convinced that I had the right training, and I was emulating some of my mentors, and I was very tough with the cooks and when the food wouldn't be good I would throw back the plates at them and I was screaming in the kitchen and I was very abusive um, very mad very angry and uh, and and I was losing all the good elements in the team and the waiters didn't want to work with me so they didn't want to come to the kitchen and all the good individuals of Le Bernardin were leaving and one day I I was at home and I was thinking about my misery <laughs> and, <laughs> and and the misery of others. And I have this moment, I don't, I, I don't know why, but it happened. And, and I'm so grateful to that moment. But I realized that you cannot be happy and angry at the same time, that your brain doesn't process that, right? you either way angry or you're happy. And... Uh, I was thinking, why? Are, so, if I am angry, why am I so angry? And I realized it's because I was miserable in my life, miserable in a kitchen, and uh, and the people around me that deserved uh, to be to be thanked for the hard work and encouraged to do a better work were were not. And um, I overnight changed my philosophy, and. It it came with few challenges because I was training to be uh, the sous chefs how to be like me, and the day after I was like, guys, everything we did yesterday is yeah. wrong. <laughs> 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 and, and it took a bit of time to change, right? I mean, they were like, <laughs> what's happening with him? Uh, but today at Le Bernardin, uh, we do not tolerate any kind of abuse uh, at all, and uh, we have a zero tolerance for that. And I think because of that zero tolerance we first of all um, inspire a generations of people who work, work for us to come with us a lot of them stay with us for a long time and um, and then they succeed in in their career uh, and and they they achieve whatever they want to achieve but our our environment in a dining room and in a kitchen is a non-violent environment and it seems, I mean, did you find resistance from in the beginning from people who might have also come up in the worlds that you were familiar with as well, when you sort of said, we're going to do this a different way? You, inside Le Bernardin yeah. or outside? Or both, I guess. Well, outside, so outside, I don't know. I mean, I, d I think in, in, in the U.S., um, we d we have much more positive reinforcement in general, in especially in my field. Uh, and in Europe is not necessarily the case. And you have to find um, a good middle ground, middle, a good balance, because if it's only positive reinforcement, sometimes you don't achieve uh, what you're supposed to achieve with your team. It's like, oh, you burned the fish for the third time. <laughs> 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 oh, it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not going to work, right? And <laughs> so you have to find a, a, a balance. But now, if you if you're throwing the, the pan at the cook when he's burning the fish, he's obviously he's not happy to burn the fish. It's a mistake. So you have to find a certain way to 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 manage the team. And do you, um, when you're on your in your day to day now, do you get a lot of gratification out of the team part of it, out of the sort of like team management and the the people part of your your job? Yes, I'm very um, very happy with when I see young members of our team su succeeding um, and actually right now is January and we're ending the reviews of the employees 
and I make sure that I listen to every employee and, and w what they wish to achieve. And then we give them, of course, feedbacks and so on to, to help them to achieve w what they want. And we take notes. And then if they are with us the following year and the following year and the following year, we look at the notes and we show them the progress that we have done. And then whoever leaves and succeed, uh, like opening a restaurant somewhere and or, or anything they, they wish, uh, of course, we are very proud of them and we're very uh, supportive of what, what they are doing. There's got to be like a uh, La Bernadette Mafia of just like really great, <laughs> well-trained managers out there. Um, how about with young people? How open do you or how open are you to when they would come? Because you seem like, look, like I think from my perception, not having met you until tonight, I always saw you as like one of the good. You seem like a really nice guy. And I think that's true as we sit here and talk. And I think it's got to mean that your staff and the people that you exist around every day feel like they can talk to you about things. And clearly, if you're open for you know, constructive feedback and things like that, that's that's great. And I imagine that also means that people on your team will come to you with ideas about, you know, what you should be doing with the food or, you know, some sort of adjustment to, yeah. you know, a change that might be in their mind. Are you open to that? And how do you deal with people's people throwing new ideas at you inside the kitchen? Yes, of course, we open to ideas. Now, the timing is key. <laughs> at, at one o'clock or, or at nine o'clock at night, sure in the middle of the service don't come with ideas <laughs> 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 but um <laughs> but of course we we have meetings and we have my door is always open to anyone who wants to come and and, and discuss with me any idea we um we have a creativity team that is uh, working all week long uh, with some of the ideas of the team my ideas and their ideas um we we have a lot of uh, communication in our team and communication is key to success I think when you don't communicate it's when you start to have problems um, so we of course encourage everybody to to have a voice to have an opinion and we listen and we are sometimes disagreeing politely and sometimes we agree and then we make the changes that we we supposed to do do you ever feel constrained by the success in the sense that Le Bernardin now has a, repu a certain reputation and, s and obviously very high standards to live up to. Does that sometimes make you feel like, I'd love to try something, but the stakes are too high? No. I, I'm, I'm not afraid of myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I'm not afraid of... I'm not afraid of anything, really. I, I just... The way the way I work with the team is exactly the way I work with creativity or in my in in my personal life. I follow my instinct. I follow my sixth sense. Um, I learn how to pause sometimes and and think uh, over the years because when I was younger I had less patience and 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 I learned the hard way because when you have less patience you're more inclined to to follow your instinct too fast and make uh, mistakes sometimes. But nothing really changed my vision except uh, what I see outside that insp inspire me. And where, d where do you find inspiration like that typically? So we are lucky because we are in New York, as you know, is the UN here. And, and uh, so we have inspiration from all over the world. Uh, it's all New York is also a very competitive city, which is excellent for... Um, for doing the right things. Um, I, I feel that competi competition is not something negative, it's something positive because it, it pushes you to do something better. And you can be competitive and you can be friendly with the people you compete with. Uh, I have a lot of friend chefs or restaurateur chefs that are, of course, competing with us and, and want our clients tonight and we want their clients tonight. But we are friends. And uh, so New York, inspire uh, in, inspire me tremendously because i can be in in chinatown or i can be um, downtown and then s at the market at union square and then i can come back to le bernardin and or go to the fish market or something like that and it, they are different worlds uh, today chefs also have the luxury to travel and i take advantage of that and i travel um to be inspired i do not travel to work 
I try not to. And um, and that also has an impact on, on what's happening then in, in my daily life at work. What was a recent travel destination that you found to be particularly inspiring? Um, Japan, for sure. I was in a fall in Japan, and it now I make sure that I go once a year in Japan. Um, it's a culture that is fascinating, and... Uh, I go to other countries, of course, not only Japan, but I, I t enjoy going there and I learn a lot um, from that culture. And you can see it on the menu at Le Bernardin when I come back. Sometimes, uh, actually, I listen to the advice of the of the, the team that says, you don't think we are a bit too Japanese? <laughs> 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 and I look at the menu, we have out of uh, 30 dishes or 25 dishes, we have 24 <laughs> Japanese influenced dishes. I'm like, yeah, maybe you're right. Yes. Right. <laughs> and uh, when you when you're doing that, how much of when you go to a place like that, uh, when you when you're going to bring back an idea or you want to sort of explore something, will you do that at home first, or will you try to do things at the restaurant first, or is it does it vary? Um, not at home. At home, I, um, when I cook, it's mostly um, home cooking and influenced by my childhood, which is in France, in the south of France and in Spain. But it's mostly at a restaurant. And I come back and we, we discuss the ideas, then we go get the ingredients. In New York, it's pretty, in it, it's pretty easy to find any ingredient you wish. Uh, it's not difficult. And then we play and it's a back and forth with the team and myself and I try and they try and we taste and we eat a lot um, and we make a lot of mistakes and then finally um, we have some ideas that are um, good enough to go on the menu. Well, I know about your uh, home habits because I think I watched you make an omelet on Instagram about 140 times the other day <laughs> trying to figure out if I could learn some tips and tricks, but it didn't work. Um, it's this, yeah. It, it's amazing how much criticism I got for th for that from that omelet. Really? Actually, <laughs> yeah. Like w uh, because I was using electric instead of gas, and because my pen was uh, nonstick, and because of whatever. And I was like, wow. <laughs> Social media is tough, man. It's tough yes. out there. I was like, I'm just cooking for my son. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow. It's amazing. <laughs> But that's kind of the thing, right? As you do, I mean, that's the thing you see with social media is it really does. You get yes. quick feedback, you know, constructive and otherwise. But yes. Um, so I want to, I, I know we're going to get close on time, but I want to, you know, leave some time for, for questions. So uh, I don't know. Do you want to, should we pass the mic around? What's the easiest way to, to do that? Okay, cool. So just raise your hand. We'll call you out. And if we can't get a mic to you, we can, it's a small room. Go ahead right here up front. Thanks for coming. Love your restaurant. You definitely don't have to worry about competing with the others for my business. <laughs> <laughs> a quick question. As, you know, we cook at home a lot, and I was wondering, where is the best place to buy fresh fish in the city, in your opinion? <laughs> um, I, I don't really know, because <laughs> I, I take fish from the restaurant, <laughs> home. <laughs> And and the fish comes from the fish market, and um, I know that not everybody can go to the fish market, especially at three o'clock in the morning. I see good fish um, at Citarella, for instance, very often. I see good fish in um, not too many <laughs> places. <laughs> Um, but <laughs> let's let's stay with Citarella. <laughs> <laughs> That's not promising. <laughs> well, well, I'm, I'm, so, I'm oh sorry. I'm going to finish what, I've, what <laughs> I'm saying here. When I say good fish, I'm talking about fish with the quality of Le Bernardin, which is sushi quality, and that's rare to find. You find some good fish, but it's not at the same level. Uh, but Citarella, for instance, because I, g I go there pretty often, um, just to look, not necessarily to buy, but they, they impress me many times. I'm, I'm not paid by them either. Thanks for coming. So I had a question about the discussion of trends, and um, one recent development is obviously more vegetarianism, more veganism. You launched the vegetarian menu recently. 
um, yet you were able to retain the fish as the star of the fight, even without fish, they have the celeriac and the daikon. How did you think about that decision since it was such a big change, and how do you maintain that, that theme? Yes, so we have, we have a testing menu at Le Bernardin that is a vegetarian testing menu that we put in place uh, at the beginning of 2019 because we had a lot of inquiries about um, having a menu that will be inspired. And, and we had a lot of clients coming to Le Bernardin and asking for vegetarian op options. And obviously a green salad is not a good option for a vegetarian necessarily. They want something a bit more elaborate when they come to Le Bernardin. And so we wanted to put a lot of efforts into it and use the same mantra that we use for the fish. So instead of the halibut is the star of the plate, the celeriac is the star of the plate. So then we build something around it. Um, the trend that you're talking about, which is vegetables um, being more present in our diets and more present in restaurants, and, restra and, and um, it's a trend that is not going to disappear. It's, it's growing. Uh, it's something that um, I have observed for quite some time now. And for people are going to vegetables for many reasons. Some of them because they like vegetables very much. Um, sometimes it's religious. Sometimes it's because of the well-being of the planet. Uh, it's I see a lot, a lot of different um, uh, ways of thinking about vegetables, but we see more and more people eating vegetables, including myself. Like on a weekend, I surprise myself in the summer, creating more and more um, vegetable dishes for the family, or, or when I entertain to my guests and having fun with the vegetables. Um, uh, as you know, New York State has a lot of farmers, and the farm stands are amazing in, in, in this region in the summer, and it's very inspiring. So that trend is going to, is going to grow. It's not something that's going to fade. I think you probably ask. I think I'll repeat it. Yeah, it's fine. Um, besides traveling outside of New York City, New York City is all already a very diverse uh, city in cultures and cuisines. Do you do any type of one-day food tour along Queens or Brooklyn, or to also meet new uh, meet new chefs, restaurant ideas, or yes. like which one is your favorite neighborhood? I don't really have a favorite neighborhood. I find inspiration everywhere. I mean, obviously, some, some neighborhoods are more challenged. If you go to the South Bronx, it's less inspiration than, of course, um, uh, going to Brooklyn, because it's an area that doesn't have necessarily too many restaurants and too many markets and, and stores uh, of quality. Um, it, it's considered, actually, a food desert. But when I go to Brooklyn, I go there to have a good experience, to have fun, to enjoy, to have good time. When I go to Queens, it's the same. Uh, it's a very different experience. If I stay in Manhattan, um, depending of what I want, I, fi I find it. Uh, it's, it's what my weekends are made of. And I take the family with me, and uh, um, they're very happy also to, to discover um, new cultures and, and uh, to eat in different places. And it's it's some it's a lifestyle. One quick follow up. To that. <laughs> so, a week you're saying that's one of your weekend uh, hobbies, right? For me as well, and I'm just trying to understand how like how do you think about your Saturday? If you wanna uh, discover a new restaurant, like how does your day start, or like what is your mindset at that point? So sometimes I plan ahead. Um, and uh, it's it's a new place that I really want to visit because it's um, it's in the media, or I know that they're doing uh, some food that is very interesting to me, and or I hear some good feedbacks about that place. Sometimes we improvise. Uh, we wake up in the morning and we have no idea where we're going for lunch, and by two o'clock in the afternoon we're having lunch somewhere. Uh, sometimes it's uh, I mean it, it we don't have really like um, a system. Weekends are, for me, weekends are to relax and have fun. And part of the fun is to really 
have a lot of freedom and to decide at the last minute uh, where we're going. When I say last minute, it's not at 10 to 2, but um, basically during the morning we discuss and we say, why don't we go to Brooklyn today? And which area? I don't know. Um, last, last time we went to Dumbo, so let's check something else and, 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 and so on. Yes, sir. Um, so I figure over the course of your career, you've had many opportunities and offers to open up other restaurants. Um, could you talk for a bit about why you may have chosen to just stick with the Bernadette? And I know you had blue for, uh, and you came in early. Yeah. I don't see I, so I saw my friends, chefs, I mean, Nobu and Jean-Georges and Daniel and Alain Ducasse and, and many other chefs developing and opening many, many restaurants and having tremendous fun with it. Um, and and uh, I was very happy with Le Bernardin. And I was like, wow, I don't know if I, can, if I can be happy opening restaurants like that. So at one point, I, I decided to open one bistro in Washington and one in Philadelphia. And I hated the idea of being in a train or being in a plane. I hated the idea of not being with my team at Le Bernardin. I hated the fact that I was not with the clients at Le Bernardin. I, I was missing it. And what I did is I closed immediately. I mean, when I say immediately, I closed two, two or three years later and never tried to open another restaurant again. And I'm very content with what I have in, in my lifestyle. It's to have Le Bernardin. I want to be with the team. Um, I, I'm not bored. But I think uh, some of my friends, I mean, when I talk to them, I know that if they were like me, they would will, they will go nuts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they would be bored to death. So it, it depends on your personality. It is no one who's right or wrong. Thank you. <laughs> There, there may not be one, but do you think that one type of fish, if you had to choose one type of fish to serve at the Bernadette, do you think one type of fish is, is the king is the best, or is it always a mix? It's like I asking a father, <laughs> <laughs> who's your favorite child? <laughs> you know? I, ca I can't answer like that. And actually, I sometimes some of the cooks uh, in our kitchen, they have the tendency to like a certain fish and dislike another one um, for different reasons. Sometimes it's the test, sometimes it's the challenge of cooking it, of preparing it. And I'm like, do not start like that. This is a big mistake. Do not have a favorite. Treat everything the same. And uh, if you start to have favorites, then you will cook differently with certain ingredients. And then the other ones will be not treated properly. So I don't, I don't have favorites. And I have only one son, so he's my favorite. <laughs> back. Uh, hi, thank you for, for speaking. I actually learned how to make pulpo la gallega watching one of your videos, and my friends love it. Uh, but my question is, like, wh how, what is the, how critical is the role of being a celebrity chef to the success of the restaurant, specifically in New York City? Well... <laughs> Being a celebrity chef I is very subjective, right? Um, but some chefs are more recognized than others. And at the end of the day, we know that it has a positive impact on, on the restaurant, economically. A chef that is recognized um, is a great ambassador for his restaurant and potentially will bring some attention and clients to the restaurant. So it's nothing wrong about being a celebrity chef. Uh, I don't feel the pressure to being recognized at all. I, I live a pretty relaxed life um, at the restaurant. As uh, soon as you open the door of the kitchen, celebrity doesn't exist any longer. And uh, when I am in a dining room, the celebrities are the clients. <laughs> so it's, it's all good. <laughs> Thank you. Any others? Back here. Um, yeah. Um, do you have any restaurants that are opening soon or you haven't gotten to get to in kind of the Manhattan, New Brooklyn, um, that yes. now everyone's going to try to? <laughs> well, the, as you know, in New York, restaurants open all the time, so many uh, and so quickly that it's hard to keep up. Um, 
I try to go at my rhythm, and uh, it's a lot of places that I haven't I haven't visited yet. I don't want to say names because <laughs> then I'm not going to have a table. <laughs> 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 okay, I give one. I want I want to try Veronica, which is in the photography uh, museum, That's right? Yeah. And um, the other day I tried to pull strings and so on and I couldn't get in and and wow. and then I called the owner and he said, "But we we close for lunch." I said, "Oh, sorry." <laughs> That's amazing. Good. Um, thank you. I've had the privilege of dining at your restaurant before. It's been fantastic. Birthdays and other special celebrations. I'm wondering, you mentioned cooking at home. Uh, you go to a lot of your favorites. Um, you know, there's such an amazing level uh, in your cuisine. At home, I clearly you make omelets. Or how do you approach cooking at home? Like, are you content just with something simple, or do you experiment at home? Um, Yes, I experiment a little bit, but not too much. Um, I like to, uh, at home, I like to feel at home. And for me, memories of my childhood are very, very important. Therefore, what I do is that I go to the market or to, do, to the supermarket or, or depending on the season, but I go and I find the ingredients that, I, that are inspiring me. So it's very seasonal. And then I come back home and I cook something that my mother was cooking for me or my grandmother was cooking for me. I'm not necessarily trying to create new dishes. Um, and also I'm, I'm listening to the family uh, saying, hey, why don't you do a coco vin again? And I'm like, oh yeah, you're right. We haven't done that in a long time. So the, the food is, it's a uh, home food, but of course I'm very precise because I'm a bit OCD about the details of you know in in the kitchen and and um, uh, my cooking is precise and I test exactly like if I was cooking for the clients but it's for the family and and, and for ultimately for myself at the end um, I'm I'm basically applying the the rules and tex techniques of a professional kitchen in in my kitchen but I'm the I'm the dishwasher and I'm the cook and I'm <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got time for one more. Let's do someone that hasn't had one yet. Go ahead. Um, what's one of your favorite restaurants to go to with like a big group of friends in the city? Uh, that's a tricky, tricky one too because I I love so many different restaurants. Um, it's uh, you know if I if I say for the fine dining if I say Daniel he's going to say why not Jean George so I'm going to say Jean George <laughs> then he's going to say eh, eh, and Massa so I'm going to say yes Massa and then we go and. And for fun, it's Balthazar, and, and you know, it's uh, I, I go everywhere, really. <laughs> Amazing. Well, look, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you to thank Chef you. Repair for being here thank as well, and uh, and really, thank you so much to the Strand. It's it's uh it's great to be in a in a store like this. So please shop around, hang out for a minute. Uh, I think Chef's gonna sign some books as well. But uh, thank you guys again for being here. We appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much.